everybody's seen the paratroopers in the movies. They're only reserved for the most daring and dangerous missions. And everybody's seen them jump from planes. A unit like the 82nd Airborne can get 5,000 soldiers anywhere on the planet within 18 hours. And they get them there by parachute. They don't just drop people. They drop cargo, bundles of supplies, food, water, boats, pretty much anything that can be rigged and fit inside of a plane can be dropped. Paratroopers are the stars of the show, but who packs these parachutes? The soldiers who prepare and pack the chutes are called parachute riggers, Army MOS 92 Romeo, or basically job code 92R. And here's what's fascinating about riggers and why I wanted to do a video about them. Most of these soldiers are very, very young and have a level of responsibility we can't even fathom. This sergeant is 23 years old and holds the lives of hundreds of paratroopers in her very capable hands. Can you imagine having that level of responsibility at 23 years old? Now, we often think of World War II when we think of paratroopers, but the first combat drop was actually performed during World War I when an Italian lieutenant named Alessandro Tandura dropped behind Austro-Hungarian lines on a sabotage mission. Armies experimented with paratroopers during the interwar years. Germany performed the first mass paratrooper forced insertion during the invasion of Denmark. Then they used paratroopers again during the Battle of Crete. But these German Fallschirmjäger paratroopers took so many casualties during that mission that they never really used them again. While Germany edged away from using paratroopers, the British and American militaries thought differently and saw opportunities to do things better. An American test platoon was formed in June of 1940 in order to develop airborne tactics and equipment. Eventually, the 82nd Infantry Division was redesignated the 82nd Airborne Division. And their first jump into Sicily in 1943 was met with mixed success. Only half of the Airborne Force was able to reach their assigned locations, but they were able to create enough chaos in the rear that forces were drawn away from the landing zones on the beach, and this became the template for the invasion of Normandy. Airborne jumps were occasionally used during the wars in Korea and Vietnam, although they were smaller affairs, and most jumps in Vietnam consisted of mainly Special Forces personnel. Mass drops of Army Rangers were used during the invasion of Grenada in 1983 and during the 1989 invasion of Panama. Then America had a long pause. People even began questioning the utility of paratroopers. Then came the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, when army rangers were used on a special mission to attack an airfield in Afghanistan. The last mass drop and largest drop since World War II was Operation Northern Delay in 2003, when the 173rd Airborne Brigade jumped into northern Iraq to give the Iraqi army another front to worry about. Now, some people say that the era of large-scale airborne operations is over, but Look at what the 173rd did. They created a dilemma, not a problem, for the Iraqi army. A problem has one solution. A dilemma has two or more solutions, each with an equally bad outcome. So back in 2003, for the Iraqi army, they had a huge dilemma. If they pulled troops away from the south to deal with the 173rd paratroopers in the north, they would have fewer troops to fight in the south. But if they didn't do that, they would have the 173rd run wild in the north. That's a heck of a dilemma. 5,000 paratroopers suddenly appearing in your country and you can do absolutely nothing to stop it. It's enough to give you second thoughts about your career as a dictator. And believe it or not, this actually happened without the 82nd Airborne ever firing a shot. In 1991, a Haitian general named Raoul Cedra staged a coup and ousted the democratically elected president of Haiti. Over the next three years, Cedras went on to kill about 3,000 opposition leaders. In 1994, the United Nations had had enough of General Cedras' shenanigans, and they authorized the United States to remove General Cedras from power. General Cedras vowed to fight. A U.S. delegation, including the former General Colin Powell, traveled to Haiti and showed General Cedras live video footage of the 82nd Airborne being loaded onto planes. General Cedras wisely took the offer of exile in Panama. So the 82nd Airborne isn't just America's premier contingency force, it's America's premier dilemma force. And the first step in the liberation of the oppressed from the sky comes from the parachute riggers, the young men and women who pack the chutes for the paratroopers and cargo. A good rigger follows procedure, pays extreme attention to detail, and has an impeccable work ethic. And here's what's really fascinating about riggers. 
These soldiers have the only job in the army that nobody else can do. Any soldier, regardless of their job, can theoretically fight his infantry. You could give someone with no experience a short class and they could feed rounds into an M777 howitzer. All soldiers perform basic first aid, not at the level of a medic, but basic. But nobody, absolutely nobody except a rigger can pack a parachute. The rigger motto is I will be sure always. And the Red Rigger baseball cap has been a symbol of their expertise since the 1940s. In fact, when paratroopers are in the pack shed, which is also known as Green Ramp, a team of riggers is always present to correct any last minute deficiencies. Paratrooper will find a problem with either their shoot or a buddy's shoot and someone will shout, and the rigger will literally leap into action to go and solve that problem. And they do find problems. Oftentimes it's a bad retainer band, and these are the bands that hold the static line or cord that automatically opens the parachute when you jump from the plane. Other times the problem is my parachute doesn't look pretty, the paratrooper just doesn't like the way his parachute looks, and the rigger will fix it anyway just to make the paratrooper more comfortable. And other times it's a manufacturing defect that wasn't caught. While I was at Fort Bragg filming this, an eagle-eyed rigger found a strap that was twisted in a manufacturing defect. A twisted strap might not seem like a big deal, but it reduces the tensile strength or resistance to breaking under tension. And that's definitely not something you want to happen when you're in the air. So how is a parachute pack? Well, in order to explain that, we have to start with the parachute. Most parachutes used by the military are 100% made in America by the team at Mills Manufacturing in Woodfin, North Carolina, or by Airborne Systems in California. Now, there's about four different kinds of parachutes. There's different kinds for cargo, different kinds for special forces, but I'm mainly going to talk about the personnel parachutes, the T-11 main and the T-11 reserve. A parachute like the T-11 main is designed to take up to 400 pounds of paratrooper and gear, open in the slipstream of an aircraft, and deliver its human cargo 1,000 feet safely to the ground at a rate of speed that is no more dangerous than jumping off a second floor balcony. Now, when the riggers receive these parachutes, they're collected from the last drop zone where they're rolled up into a UPRB, or Universal Parachutist Recovery Bag, and stacked up for return to the pack shed. Oh, wait, I just said pack shed. Remember a couple of minutes ago I said paratroopers are in the pack shed, which is also known as green ramp. Okay, so there is the pax shed, which is P-A-X, and there is the pack shed, which is P-A-C-K. And oftentimes you hear them used in the same sentence, such as, hey, I'm going to leave the pack shed and head over to the pack shed. Now that's a fine army sentence if I ever heard one. Now once these chutes are back at the pack shed, P-A-C-K, the chutes are hung up in a 22-story tower. They're shaken out and dust and debris fall all over the place and go through a serrated floor. You get dirt and branches and rocks falling down on top of you. I spoke with one rigger who had to contend with a live squirrel that fell out of the parachute and ran around the pack shed. If the parachutes get wet, they're hung up and dried for 24 hours using heaters and fans inside that building. Then they're brought back down, rolled up, and placed near the pack floor for repacking. Now the missions are planned months in advance, so the riggers have time to prepare for the mission. I'm not allowed to say how many parachutes the 82nd Airborne has, but it's enough to fill this entire warehouse and support all the 82nd Airborne's training and contingency missions. Now, when a rigger reports for work in the pack shed, they already know the types of chutes they'll be packing that day. The first step to packing a T-11 main is to gather all of your consumables, things like retainer bands and quarter-inch cotton webbing. Then they lay the chute out and inspect all of the gores and the seams between the gores. Now, gore may seem like kind of a weird word, but it's basically a piece of material used in making a segment of a sail, a garment, or an umbrella. These are the gores on an umbrella, and these are the gores on a parachute. T-11 main parachute has 28 gores, and each gore must be inspected for holes, rips, and tears. Gores are connected to the parachute suspension lines. These lines are checked for any kinds of frays or breaks. These suspension lines are in turn connected to risers. These risers are heavy nylon straps that connect the suspension lines to the parachute packing tray and in turn to the harness that holds the paratrooper. Once the inspection is finished, the rigger grabs the IP or in-process inspector. These are soldiers who wear rigger hats inside the pack shed. They're usually sergeants and they stand at the edge of the pack table supervising the packing. 
Then they put all of the parachute information on DA Form 3912, or the Army Parachute Log Record, along with serial number and date of manufacture. Now it's back to folding. The rigger folds the gores left over right like you're folding a piece of paper. Then they put on the deployment sleeve. This 19-foot sleeve has one critical purpose. It protects the parachute from any friction and actually helps the parachute open. And I'm going to show you how that works in a sec. Then they fold the bridle line, which is attached to the deployment sleeve. This in turn is attached to a pilot or drogue chute. This drogue chute pulls off the sleeve in a very slow and controlled manner, which exposes the parachute. This comparatively controlled reveal of the parachute is kind of like slowly opening an umbrella in the wind. It reduces shock to the static lines and to the paratrooper. In the next step, the rigger gets out the deployment bag and connects the deployment bag to the deployment bag cradle. This deployment bag is what the parachute sleeve actually sits in. The deployment bag is then connected to a static line. This static line is ultimately going to be connected to the airplane, so the chute will open automatically, but we'll get to that. The sleeve is packed inside the deployment bag in an accordion or S-fold fashion, with the drogue chute going in first. Why first? because the parachute deployment bag will be upside down. When the static line pulls off the bag, we're going to reveal the parachute like we're revealing a cake. Then the rigger folds the side flaps and inserts locking stows to keep the deployment bag closed for the next step. Another rigger check is then performed. The deployment bag is pulled out of the deployment bag cradle and positioned on the table. The rigger will then store the suspension lines into each of the six stores. Then the packer annotates the deployment bag on a sheet and DA form 3912, and the deployment bag is rotated onto the pack tray. Now the pack tray flaps are closed around the deployment bag, kind of like closing a homemade envelope or wrapping a present. It's this pack tray that's connected to the risers of the parachute, and the risers are connected to the harness, which is connected to the paratrooper. The pack tray is kept closed by a very special curved pin that is designed to release only when the static line is pulled. This special and very important pin is then tied down and the pack tray is closed. Now, if the parachute is supposed to be used on a C-17, a line changer is added to the chute. This gives another five feet of length to make up for the C-17's large girth. Once finished, the parachute goes to FI, or final inspection. Then it goes into a parachute cage in the PIF, or parachute issue facility. There are warehouses full of these cages, and eventually the cage will be delivered to the PAX shed by truck to support airborne operations. And support they do. The average soldier in the 82nd Airborne will do two tactical jumps a month, and they can usually walk on for jumps without combat equipment. Those jumps are called Hollywood jumps, and people who just like to jump can walk on to any unit that's jumping if they have the space. And if you like to jump, become a rigger. Riggers jump more than anybody. They even jump their own shoots, which is part of their training at rigger school. In fact, this one rigger said, if they had a job where I could just like test parachutes all day, I would probably do that. That'd be cool. In fact, at any given point, a rigger can be asked to jump a chute that they packed or any other rigger packed. And if you can't jump because of illness or injury, you can't pack. Riggers take this whole quality process so seriously that they're limited to only packing 15 parachutes a day. Once they finish 15, they're done for the day. They may have other ancillary duties or they may be sent home to prepare for the next day. Now about these parachutes. These parachutes cost about $7,000 each and they have a very specific lifespan. Once a T-11 is packed, it can only stay on the shelf for 182 days before it must be repacked. The total service life for a T-11 parachute is 12 years. So as you're walking around the pack shed, you'll actually see parachutes that have been placed in bins that are going to be removed from the supply system because they're too old. Every paratrooper gets a reserve parachute called a T-11R. The T-11 main is on the back. The T-11R is on the front. The slightly smaller reserve chute is there in case the first malfunctions. So that being said, how does a parachute function? All of the jumpers connect their static lines to an anchor line in the plane. They're assisted by jump masters identified by this red patch. Each exit door has a jump master who controls the jump and then jumps themselves. Every plane also has jump master safeties who don't jump, but they have the very important job of handling the static lines during the exit. 
Now, when the jumper leaves the aircraft, they trail the static line. The static line goes taut. Now, you can't see it unless we make the pack tray transparent, but the static line is looped inside the pack tray and then connected to the deployment bag. So as the static line goes taut, the curve pin is pulled out. This opens the pack tray like an envelope splitting open. The deployment bag is pulled out of the pack tray, revealing the deployment sleeve. The static line and deployment bag get left on the airplane. Eventually, they'll get hauled back inside and the next jumper gets ready. Meanwhile, the drogue chute is slowing the paratrooper down and the deployment sleeve is sliding off of the parachute, making sure the parachute opens slowly from the bottom. The parachute eventually fully deploys and the paratrooper is safely lowered to the drop zone. Now surrounding the drop zone are medics, pathfinders, and special riggers called MALFOs or malfunction officers. The medics are there in case of injury. Most drops are incredibly safe considering what these soldiers do, but there's always the occasional sprain or mild concussion. The pathfinders are there to mark the drop zone, which they normally do with large orange panels that spell a letter. This letter indicates to the pilot that the plane they're in is in the right place in case there's multiple drop zones. These pathfinders are in constant communication with the pilots of the aircraft transports, and they use wind speed and multiple other factors to determine when the paratroopers should jump. And they are so good that they even set up this special marker called a RAM, or raised angle marker, to determine where the first paratrooper will land. Finally, we have the Malfos. They come out to watch every drop in case there's any malfunctions, no matter how small, they can record this problem, collect evidence, and begin any investigations. So that's everything it takes in order to perform a tactical drop. So let me take you to the inside of the C-17, August 9th, 2022, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne are standing with their static lines hooked up to the C-17's anchor points. They have the green light to drop. What happens next is the culmination of thousands of man hours of work for just one minute of a safely executed tactical drop. Hey, slip away! Slip away! The jump is complete. The paratroopers rigor roll their parachutes and stuff them into the UPRB. Some of them will move out for a follow-on mission. Others who are on the Hollywood jump will wait for buses that'll take them back to main post. And the 82nd Airborne will do it all over again next week. Thanks to the young men and women who wear these red hats. I was the first YouTuber ever to be invited down to Fort Bragg to cover a story, so I have to start by thanking quite a few people. Thank you to the 18th Airborne Corps and the 82nd Airborne for taking a risk on a YouTuber who mainly does open source intelligence in his bathrobe. Thank you to Major Jennifer Armstrong, the PAO or Public Affairs Officer of the 18th Airborne Corps. This amazing officer opened a lot of doors for me that never would have been opened without her presence. Thank you to Major Cody Chelman, uh, the PAO of the 82nd Airborne. Without you, this video would have been far more boring. Thank you to Sergeant Major Alex Lycia. Without you going to bat for me, none of this would have happened. Thank you to Warrant Officer Catherine Green and the 11th Quartermaster for letting me film your parachute rigger facility. Thank you to Sergeant Jody Howe for explaining the parachute packing process. And thank you, Sergeant White, for allowing me to follow you around the pack shed like a rigger Tinkerbell as you helped out with that mission.
Also, special thanks to the 647th Quartermaster Warrant Officers Chesley Ashley and William Carroll. These soldiers let me witness how airborne delivery loads are packed, which is a crucial component to this video. I left Fort Bragg amazed at the capability and professionalism of these young soldiers who defend America. Tom Brokaw had it wrong. The greatest generation wasn't from yesteryear. They're serving today when they don't even have to, ready to jump from the sky to fight tyranny and oppression. Thank you for watching. Hey guys, I'm at Fort Bragg right now. I'm with Sergeant Cook. He's a rigger in the 11th Quartermaster. Riggers are the guys who wear the red hats. They actually pack the parachutes that the paratroopers use. I'm doing a whole video on this, but Sergeant Cook has a funny story about his first time on an airplane. So my first time on an airplane, I was in airborne school at Fort Benning, Georgia, and the black hat was looking around. He goes, who hasn't been on an airplane before? Raise your hand. So I raised my hand. I was looking around and no one else had their hand up besides me. Black hat comes up to me. He's like, congratulations, you're number one jumper. So I was like, sweet. So I'm standing there and we rig up, we get on the plane and everything. They open up that door. I stand in the doorway. My first five times on an airplane, I jumped out. Never <laughs> landed on the ground. <laughs> Thank you for that story, Sergeant Cook. No problem.